Well, good morning again and welcome. I'm so glad to see each one of you on this uh, kind of chilly morning. And you braved the weather to make it here. And I'm glad because, you know, God calls us to worship him. And uh, it's not because he needs the accolades or the uh, propping up with his, his ego. It's, be it's because he knows that we need to refocus on him because he is righteous and he is good. And we are sadly lacking in those areas. So thank you for coming to worship today. And I pray that uh, you experience God as we worship together. You know, one of the things sometimes we, uh, we talked this morning, some of us uh, church leaders, about are we going to have church today? Is, is it bad? And so we went out and we tested it. And we saw, you know, it was bad last night. It was pretty icy, but things were improving this morning. So we thought it's safe enough to have church. And sometimes you have to test the waters, right? God asks us to test and see if, um, if we are in his will to think about that. If, if we are, it's safe to continue on in the path that we are currently treading. And uh, I want to give a, a big thank you to uh, um, Paul, first of all, and to Dale and to Dennis. I heard Dennis was in on this and Howard too. They came way early this morning and helped clear the parking lot, the, uh, the sidewalk, salting them and clearing them of the snow and ice, so making it safe for the rest of us to follow. And that's, that's one of the things I think is, is what God really enjoys to see, um, us lifting each other up, holding each other up, um, looking out for one another. And I, I just want to say thank you to each of you who came this morning and uh, helped prepare the way for the rest of us. Um, at this time, before we get into the sermon, I'd just like to invite up some of our youth that went to the GYC conference. So don't be shy. Come on up. I talked to, with some of your parents, and hopefully you got a little bit of a warning there. I just want to uh, interview you a little bit and see, have you tell us a little bit about what you experienced at um, GYC just a few weeks ago. So come on up. Um, gather up here beside me. And uh, so it, many of you um, knew already that uh, these young people went to a special um, gathering called GYC, and uh, that was just a few weeks ago, and uh, it was a special trip. We didn't really uh, know that far in advance, did we, that uh, this is something that you guys were going to get to do, but I just want to have, who wants to volunteer and tell a little bit about what GYC was? What, what actually happened there? Just in your own words, no, uh, no uh, pressure here. What, what did you do? Jeremiah, do you want to start us off? <laughs> you, look, you have that look of bravery in your eyes. I'm going to give you the microphone and ask you, what, you know, what happened? You, you left here. How did you travel? Well, the travel was long. Okay. And very achy. Okay. So, sitting in the car for almost twelve hours. Oh, long car ride. Yeah. All right. Um, so what what city was was the? It was in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. All right. So long car trip. You want to pass the microphone? What what uh, either direction there? What uh, what kind of things happened at GYC? What was the what was it like, Andrew? What do you think? Mostly meetings. Meetings. All right. <laughs> Okay, meetings can be boring or meetings can be exciting. What, what was your general take on uh, on these meetings? I liked the nightly meetings because I could see like you could see everyone who was there and how many people came. Okay, everyone from all across the country. Awesome. Did you know there was that many uh, Adventist youth? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So so, so so nightly meetings were interesting for you. Yeah. Awesome. You want to pass the mic? So, what was the experience like? I, I hear there was some um, breakout meetings, some seminars that you guys all got to pick and choose from. Tell us, what, what was one seminar that you picked to go to and what was, what was that all about? So, as far as the uh, breakout sessions that like, I went to personally, um, I, uh, I can't remember his last name, but um, his first name was Sebastian, but uh, he was kind of... Um, he was an entrepreneur, and he was kind of uh, able to tie in like his religion and his faith with his his business, and showing ways to do that, and then giving helpful insights on that. So it was interesting to be able to 
to listen to him talk about that. That, that is cool. Uh, some real life experience and, and how God was real in his life. That's awesome. All right. Pass the, the, the mic there. So, Michaela, can you tell us what was, out of the whole thing, what was your, your favorite experience? Was it the car ride there, spending time with good friends here, some, something that spoke to you in the meetings? What, what was your absolute favorite thing? Um, I enjoyed the nightly meetings, and I also enjoyed the ARC experience, so that was fun to go see. Okay, tell us a little bit about the ARC experience. What, what was that like? What was... was um, um, it was cool to see like the actual size of the ark and there was a lot of like different facts and stuff. It was very educational. Okay, so this was a, a model of Noah's ark then? Yes. Awesome, awesome. So, so that would be cool to see. All right, and uh, Madeline, you're, you get to share with us. Um, tell us uh, kind of your overall impressions. What, did you, did you experience anything new um, in your walk with Jesus at these meetings, or, or was there a speaker that really inspired you? Um, the speaker that really inspired me was like at one of the breakout sessions. It was Sam Walters, I think, because that's me. Well, he spoke about how Esther, how she hid her identity as being a Jew, and how we shouldn't hide our identity, that we should be like Joseph, who showed who he was. That really like spoke out to me. Like I should really do that. Well, thank you for sharing that. That that is inspiring and and something I think we can all learn uh, more about and to uh, walk walk that way with our life. Is there anybody else that kind of like the best thing, a uh, different experience, best thing that happened while you were there? Um, something that you'll hold with you for a long time in your your memory. Anybody else have anything they want to share? All right, lots of uh, quiet. <laughs> So thank you so much. You guys can go sit down. Thank you so much for sharing uh, with, with us. There's been some pictures about up there. We are so glad that you guys got to go and experience um, the different uh, people that shared at those meetings and, and the ARC experience. This is a, was a great opportunity for our youth just to connect with other youth uh, their age and to uh, learn from some of the experiences of other youth that are in ministry for God and to uh, really be lifted up um, and a, just a, a time of, of uh, sharing together. So hopefully um, we'll get to do this, uh, send our youth again to GYC and they do this once a year is my understanding. And I just wanted our church family to be aware of some of the things that uh, our youth are experiencing and, and are getting to do, and I thought you would, might enjoy that. Um, let's get into the Word today. I've been thinking the past few weeks as, uh, as it's been a new year, and I've been thinking in my own life and also about our church, what would be kind of a, a good theme for this year in our walk with God? In our, in our walk together as we worship him, um, as we look to do ministry together. And uh, I've been thinking, what, what does God want to challenge me with for growth in my own life? What, do, what is the one thing this year that I could spend an entire year on and looking at and studying that would make the most difference in my life, in my walk with my Savior, Jesus Christ? I don't know about you, but that's not something that I've really done as deeply before. You know, usually the new year rolls around and I think, well, last year was pretty good. What's ahead for this, this coming year? I don't know. We'll see. There's, this year has been a little bit different. I've been thinking about that. Maybe it's because I've been uh, asked by you all to, uh, to help lead our church. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe it's God's Holy Spirit working on my heart. I'm not sure um, exactly, but... Let's take a little time this morning and think about what is one thing that would really make a huge difference in our life as we walk with God, as we, as we learn about him and know him more, as, we, uh, as he becomes a deeper and more precious friend to us. What is one thing we could talk about? And over and over I keep coming to the fact that 
God wants something to say, has something to say to each one of you. He has something to say to me and to each one of you, and he wants to talk with you intimately. Recently, I was listening to one of my favorite musical artists, and uh, I've heard this song many times, but as I listened to it um, recently, it really made an impact on me, and it, because it was talking about the same topic, the voice of God and how he speaks to us. And uh, the words go like this. There's uh, several uh, verses in, in the chorus here. The first verse says, Is not he who formed the ear worth the time it takes to hear? Should he who formed our lips for speaking be not heeded when he speaks? And then the chorus says, Will you not listen? Why won't you listen? God has spoken love to us. Why will you not listen? And the second verse says, Listen to the sacred silence. Listen to the holy word. Listen as he speaks through living parables that must be heard. He spoke a word of flesh and blood, flesh and blood that bled and died, bled and died just to be heard. How could you not hear his word? And then the final verse says, Why will you, will you not hear his word? Will you not listen? Why won't you listen? God has spoken hope to us. How could you not listen? Why will you not listen? How could you not listen? And that was written by Michael Card, and he was specifically looking at some verses in Isaiah where God makes the same cry out to his people. Why won't you listen when I speak hope to you, when I, when I speak love to you. I don't know about you, but I often fall in the trap when I'm talking with somebody and they're, they're uh, doing the talking part. I'm supposed to be doing the listening part, right? But often I'm thinking in my mind, what am I going to be saying next? What, can, what is my story for them? What can I share? And, and most of the time, I, I'm ashamed to say, I miss a lot of what the other person is saying. Have you ever fell into that uh, scenario before? Uh, I don't think it's too uncommon. Um, but that happens a lot, I'm afraid, and where we, we're not such good listeners as we are to speaking. And if I examine my own prayer life, I think this um, follows the same path in my, my prayer life and my conversations with God. Too often I'm busy asking for things or telling him how bad I <laughs> have been and what terrible situation I'm encountering and how perplexed and, and wondering what to do. And then I say amen and I'm off on my way, right? We, we're often just asking for, for things and not taking that time to listen. And God says, why won't you listen? I have hope for you. I have love for you. I want to share with you help and healing, but you're too busy. You're, you're not listening. You're not, you're not taking the time it takes to hear the help I want to give to you. As any loving father will tell you, they love to provide help and, and care for their children, right? Even, um, even my dad, you know, all my brothers and I, we're grown. We have families of our own. Um, but... He still loves to do um, things for us and, and give us gifts. And all, when I was growing up, he loved to take us out and help us experience different things in life. He'd take us on a, uh, a trip or something, and we'd, we'd go to the mountains. And that was pretty special considering I, that I grew up in Iowa where there's not too many mountains around there. <laughs> or he took us on a trip one time to the ocean and helped us experience the, what the ocean was like and, and the majesty that God had created in the ocean and the animals that lived there. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. There's nothing like this where we live in Iowa. And so dad was always trying to give us, you know, uh, good things and teach us things and show us what God is like by the way that he lived his life. And my mom the same way, very, um, very intentional about showing us what God is like and, and giving us good things. Well, how would it make a loving parent who is trying to do such a, as that feel 
if we never stopped to accept their counsel or accept their wisdom or what they were trying to teach us, and we were always busy asking for things, and then as soon as we uh, were done asking, out the door, off to the next thing. That'd be hurtful, wouldn't it? And I, I've been thinking about that this week and thinking, how must that hurt our loving Father in heaven when we're too busy, we're uh, not engaged to actually hear the answers to our prayers? That must be awfully hurtful to him. And it makes me sad that I've done that so often. Well, I want to turn for a minute and look at the experience of Samuel. God spoke to Samuel when he was just a boy. Uh, when he was a boy, now this is, by the way, this is found in 1 Samuel chapter 3, 1 through 11. When Samuel was a boy, he uh, ministered in the temple with the high priest Eli. And the Bible says that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And uh, I thought about that. And in those days, in, in Bible times, of course, God spoke audibly to some of, of the uh, patriarchs, right? And, and uh, we know for certain that God spoke in an audible voice that you could hear with your ears to Moses at the burning bush. He called out to Moses. And uh, Moses, was, um, Moses was humbled in that experience before the burning bush. And Moses listened to Almighty God, the loving Father, who reached out to Moses to save his people. And uh, a few other times in the wilderness, in the, on the mountain, God spoke from out of the cloud to the people down below and, get, and made a special covenant with them, didn't he? That covenant was to point forward to that saving relationship with when Christ would come and take away our sin and make the ultimate sacrifice. And so that was an audible voice. And what did the people say? They said, Moses, that was too much for us. You talk to us. You go talk to God and tell us what he said. We can't handle when God talks to us personally. Have you ever felt like that? When God's what he's trying to communicate to you is a little bit sticky. I mean, it, it hits to that part in your life that you're, you've been struggling with, and maybe you don't want to give up some uh, sin or some temptation that you've found pleasure in in the past. I've been there where God says, this is the way, walk you in it. And I say, but Lord, I'm walking over here. I, I'm, I'm comfortable here. I, over there is scary. And he says, no. He says, come. Come over here. This is the way. Walk you in it. And, and it's like the children of Israel when they were out there in the wilderness. They say, Moses, you go talk to God. It's too much for us. Sometimes I felt that way. Maybe you have too. But here, coming back to our story in Samuel, um, there had been a time in the land where there hadn't been a prophet. There hadn't been, um, there had been some judges of course, but there was, it was a time where the, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And have you ever felt like that? that? That you cry out to God, but it's hard to hear his response? Have you ever felt that God was being silent to your pleas? I don't know. I sure have been. I've felt that in the past. And so this time, it says the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And there was no widespread revelation. In verse 2, And it came to pass in that time that while Eli was lying down in his place at night, he, was, he went to bed. When his eyes had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, he was, he was elderly and his eyesight wasn't what it used to be. Um, it says that before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of, the, of God was, while Samuel was laying down, that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, Here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Right? So Eli was, was mentoring young Sam, Samuel. He was uh, raising him. Um, and Samuel ran to him and said, You called? 
Eli, or Samuel was confused. He, he, had not, he was a young boy. He hadn't heard the lo- word of the Lord speak to him before. And, and he thought it was Eli calling out. Is it possible that sometimes we confuse the voice of God with someone else? Uh, I think so, especially if we're not in the habit or practice of, of walking with God and, and listening to his voice. We can become confused and think some, someone else is calling out to us when it's actually God. Well, Eli said to Samuel, I didn't call you. Go, go lay down. Go back to sleep. And again, the Lord called to Samuel. And Samuel ran to Eli and said, here I am. You did call me. And as we often know, the young kids, they have good hearing, don't they? Sometimes uh, parents will whisper to each other about plans for the day or or something special that's going to happen. And even though they try to be a a little bit secretive, the kids still hear, don't they? And uh, so this was the case. Samuel's hearing was good. He was just not aware that it was his father in heaven calling to him. He thought it was Eli. So the second time, Eli says to him, no, I didn't call you. Go lay down. And the Lord called Samuel a third time, and he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. And it was at that point that Eli perceived that the Lord had called young Samuel. And he had some good advice for Samuel. He said, Go, lie back down, and it shall be, if he calls you again, you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and he lay down in his place. And now the Lord came and stood and called at his other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered and said, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And uh, in verse 11, it says, And the Lord said to Samuel, and then it goes on to to the uh, message that he had for Eli and for the nation. But uh, when we actually stop and recognize the voice of the Lord in our life and that he is calling to you and I, we should, like Samuel, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, right? We're, we're listening to you. And uh, then the Lord, it says he stood by and uh, talked with young Samuel. And I don't know about you, but I think that will make all the difference in our life this year. If we hear the word of the Lord, and as, as young Samuel did, invite the Lord to speak to us. Well, those were well and good. The Bible records those times that God spoke to his different uh, servants and workers and prophets, sometimes aloud, sometimes perhaps uh, more quietly, that still small voice. Have you ever wondered how Abraham knew that it was God uh, calling him to go sacrifice his son Isaac? Have you ever thought about that? How did Abraham know that this was God telling him to go sacrifice Isaac? That it, it didn't make any sense. Here the pagans in, in their religion would sacrifice their children to their gods, but the God of heaven was different, right? And yet the God of heaven asked Abraham to do something similar, to take his only son and sacrifice him. How, it, you parents that are out there, how would you... How would you recognize that as God's voice? How did Abraham know? That's, that's an important question to ask, right? Well, I have a feeling it was because Abraham had walked with God for many years. And Isaac was, was born late in Abraham's life. Abraham had walked with God for many, many years. And he had spent a life listening to God, sometimes making mistakes, but yet making those corrections and and still um, wanting to walk with God throughout his life. He recognized, uh, Abraham recognized the voice of God, just like you and I would recognize the voice of one of our loved ones if they walked up from behind us, right, and said, hello, right? If my wife walked up behind me and I didn't know she was there and said, hey, I would instantly know who it was because I, I walked with her, I, I spent time with her, I've, I've talked with her, and I've, I've spent that relationship time building that up to the point where I know her voice. And I'm sure each one of you could say the same about your loved ones. 
how you would know their voice and recognize it with just one word, even if you didn't see them. And I think that's how it was with Abraham when he um, heard God tell him to sacrifice his son Isaac. He recognized <coughs> God's voice because he had spent that time in relationship with him. He loved God and, uh, and recognized his voice. Even though it's, the message seemed contrary to what he knew, he knew it was the voice of God. So that's well and good, but does God speak to us today? It's an important question, isn't it? Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7 uh, says this, and these are the voice of Jesus. Jesus says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Is Revelation a book for long ago, or is it for a, bo a book to be understood today? Today, I would say, right? It contains prophecies about the end of time. And as we know um, from various things, the, the prophe prophecy in Daniel where uh, the Day of Atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary, we know that that happened in 1844. So we are indeed living in the end days. And Revelation is a book all about the end of time. And here God says, Jesus says, uh, He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, the church is you and I, right? It's, uh, the church is made of people. And this is a message for people. So God does have a message for us today. And he wants us to be listening for his voice and to cultivating that relationship where we recognize him when he speaks. Um, so the question then is, how does God speak to you and me today? Here's some Bible verses that let's take a look at. Matthew 3, verse 17. This was at Christ's baptism. Uh, verse 17 says, And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. All right? So how, how was this? Uh, was this a, a still small voice in the conscience? Or was this audible for all to hear? Was this somebody else saying, uh, a person saying this on behalf of God like the prophets? It was audible, yes. And this was straight from the voice of the Father in heaven, um, recognizing Christ as his son. He says, suddenly the voice came from heaven audibly saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So one way, God sometimes chooses to audibly speak his his uh, will to his people, doesn't he? Um, and this was a case, an example of that. Another time is in Matthew 17, verses 5 and 6. This is on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus took um, just three of his disciples up on the, the mount. And verse 5 says, While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear him. And the disciples heard it, and they fell on their faces, faces and were greatly afraid. These were audible, vo this was an audible voice, just like long ago when God made that covenant with the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. These were rare instances. Generally, God uh, uses other means besides an audible voice. But I, I, couldn't find any of them as examples, but I have heard stories where God, to yet today, um, calls out to people in an audible voice, and they've heard it audibly. Here's, here's another verse that let's take a look at. John, verse 10, 1 through 5. And here Jesus is saying, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, this same person is a thief and a robber, but he who enters the door, through the door, is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice, yet they will by no means follow a stranger but flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. 
Now I've seen this, uh, a couple different examples of this. Georgina and I got the privilege to uh, travel to Africa, to Kenya, and visit a Maasai village. And there, uh, this village is surrounded by the African bush, right? So lions live there, hyenas live there, leopards, cheetahs, all these things that like to eat livestock. And uh, in this village, the, uh, the, the villagers there, they take these thorny bushes and these sticks with, with sharp pointy ends and they make this giant fence around the livestock enclosure. And all the, the different villagers who own livestock, they, at night they put their livestock into this one big pen. And then during the day, uh, they will take each man that owns livestock, he will take his livestock out into a different area to graze. So these animals have to know who is their person that's taking care of them and follow them. And this was like what it was like back in these days that Jesus is talking about. They had these communal pens where they put the sheep in for safety, and these sheep would have to follow their shepherd out to where he was leading them to feed, to get water, to take care of them. And uh, so in my own life here today, uh, when I was a, a child, I went with my grandma and grandpa to, um, over to my uncle's house. He was renting a, a house from a farmer, and uh, the, the house was surrounded by pasture land where they kept sheep. And my uncle was out of town, so we went to take care of his cats and, and make sure that um, everything was okay. And when we got there, the sheep were out of the fence. They were in his garden, eating his garden, munching on the tasty vegetables there. And uh, some were, were out dangerously close to the road where they could get hit. And so my, I remember watching my grandma and grandpa. They tried to, uh, to gather up these sheep and round them up to put them back through the gate. Well, that didn't work out so well. Some sheep went out of the garden, around the other side and back in the garden. Some went out closer to the road and, and despite their hard efforts in trying to get these sheep to cooperate and go back in the gate, it just wasn't happening. So eventually they decided they needed a different strategy. <laughs> and Grandpa went into the, in the house and he called the farmer and they just lived down the road. And a, a few minutes later, the farmer's wife came and she had a bucket. And she had a few bits of food in that bucket. And she held it up over her head and she had a stick and she banged the bucket with the stick and she said, come sheep, come sheep, come sheep. And she walked all the way to the gate, opened the gate, and those sheep just filed so nicely into line and <laughs> followed through that gate right behind her and very, Slowly, she just closed the gate, very simply. Those sheep knew their master, didn't they? They knew the shepherd. And so if we are to walk in these dangerous lands, right? We're surrounded by, by wickedness. We're on the battlefield. The di Bible describes this earth as a, a battleground where good is fighting against evil. Um, if we are to walk that path in this dangerous ground, we are ne very needing to know the, uh, the master, the shepherd of the sheep. So John 10, 26 through 27 goes on to say, But you who do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So there are some that, despite God's calling, refuse to believe and they are not his sheep because they have refused to be his sheep. I pray that none of us fall into that category. Next is John 12, 27 through 30. Jesus says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from the... He says, What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? And then he essentially says, No. He says, Because... For this purpose I came to this hour. And then he asked the Father to glorify. He says, Father, glorify your name. So he's not saying, not me, but God the Father, glorify your name. And uh, then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it 
and will glorify it again. So again, God the Father cries out audibly to humans and says, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. What's he talking about? He sent Jesus, right? He sent Jesus to represent um, the character of God in human form. Jesus was God here in human form. He says, I have glorified it. He sent Christ to save us, and he will glorify it again. So verse 29, this is important. He says, therefore, the people who stood by, who heard it, said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. So there was some who heard the voice, evidently, and thought it was thunder. To them, it was just noise and, and rumblings. But other people heard and understood the voice. Interesting. Jesus then answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake, so that you can believe in, in God. And so, God is often working that way. He reveals himself to those people who are ready and willing to humble themselves and to seek God, to believe in him with faith and trust. But to those who re constantly refuse God, he, uh, he d often just sounds like thunder. In fact, um, Psalm 95, verses 5 through 8, the psalmist says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. All right? So I, I think this specifically goes along with what we just read in John. Uh, many had the opportunity to accept Christ as their Savior, to accept His voice and His, his teaching, but they refused. They hardened their hearts, and so they did not hear God's voice when, he's, when He glorified His name. Jeremiah 16, 12 says, And you have done worse than your fathers, for behold, each one follows in the dictates of his own evil heart, so that no one listens to me. God's, God here is saying, look, you, you, want, you walk in your own path, and it's worse than the, your fathers before you. Each generation gets worse and worse, so that no one listens to God anymore. I think that's the age that we're listening in, as you see around you. So many people are so secular, um, there's only evil in their heart, and they won't listen to God. They have refused to listen to God. So he p pulls his spirit away and said, be out of my love for you. Go your own way. I won't force you to love me. Ezekiel uh, goes along with this. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, you dwell in, a, in the midst of a rebellious house, which has eyes to see, but does not see, and has ears to hear, but does not hear, for they are, are a rebellious house. Talking about the nation of Israel. Um, God gave them ears and eyes to see and hear his truth, but they refused it. They wanted their own way instead. They rebelled against God. I, my prayer is today that we would open our ears to the Lord. He has something to say to you and I. And often, the, the reason that he speaks to us is to, uh, to help us in our own journey and often to help those in the journey around us. So let's look at an example of that in... Um, in Matthew, God gave the, uh, Jesus cried out after he had told the parable of the sower. He says, he who has ears, let him hear. And then he went on to tell, uh, let me find my notes here. He went on to, to, uh, talk to the people about how much God cares about them. In Matthew 6, 25 through 33, he says, I, I say to you, therefore, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, 
nor about your body, nor what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look to the birds of the air, he says, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds the birds. Are, are you not more valuable than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? By worrying, can we add an inch to how tall we are? <laughs> no, God says, worrying is useless. Let God take, take that. Let God take the worry. He says, and he's talking to us today. He says, so why do you worry about clothing? Now consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these. Now if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith, he says. God will take care of you. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or, or what shall we wear? Or when I was a younger man, whom, whom am I going to marry? Right? God says, Don't worry about those things. He says, For after all the Gentiles seek after these things, but your heavenly Father knows what you need. He knows you need all these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So, God speaks words to us. Often they're found in the Bible. The, the Bible is the clearest, most uh, definitive way that we hear God's voice speaking to us. So I, I challenge you this year to read the Bible, looking at it in new ways, looking for what God is speaking to you personally. You know, I remember a story by my grandmother. Uh, she told this many times to me. She said when, when she was uh, a young woman, single, uh, attending church, she was uh, working with the youth, and she said one day after church, after teaching the, the youth class and, and after worship, she was gathering up her things, and a young man that she had known all her life, also in the church, um, came up to her, and very timidly, uh, with a little bit of shaking, said, would you consider going to the church social with me, this upcoming church social? And in that instant, she, she didn't hear an audible voice, but she felt very strong, very strong and compelling, uh, the words that said, don't refuse him because he'll never ask you again. <laughs> <laughs> and that was true. Years uh, I, after hearing my grandfather tell this story, so you know the ending here, uh, he said he had, before asking my grandmother on that date, he prayed to God. He said, God, you know I'm a timid man. He said, and I'm only, if it's your will that she says yes, I'm only going to ask once. So you will have to impress upon her heart. And uh, he did. God was faithful. God gave my grandma that message. She accepted, and the rest is history. Um, I have many aunts and uncles, uh, many cousins. And it's always a result of that one decision, right? And God speaking to my grandmother's heart. Um, sometimes, though, we don't always, we don't always, uh, are faith, we're not always faithful in hearing God's direction. Long, long ago, a man uh, tra was traveling through the countryside in England, I believe it was, and he saw this woman standing at a fork in the road. And she was a peddler, obviously. She had her wares um, with her, and she had the stick, and she was picking it up and throwing it in the air and watching it land. And she'd study it, and she'd go and she'd pick it up, and she'd throw it in the air, and she'd watch it land. And this happened a number of times. She just kept doing this, repeating this over and over. And he, he walked up to her and said, "Ma'am, I have to ask you, what are you doing?" And uh, she said, "Well, I'm trying to decide which way to go, right or left." And he said, what's with the stick? And she said, well, I prayed the, to God that he would lead me on my path today, and I asked him to have the stick point the direction I should go, but it keeps landing on the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh, but we've all been there, right? We keep praying the same thing, saying, God, help me in, in this way, but God keeps pointing a different direction. 
And so we need to listen to his voice and, and not be like this lady who keeps determined to follow her own way, even though she asked the Lord and prayed that he would guide her. You know, I heard a story one time about President uh, Roosevelt, FDR, and he led this country during the time of the Depression and into World War II. And he, when he was a younger man, um, maybe a child, he had polio, which which uh, greatly decreased his mobility. Often, mostly, he was in a wheelchair, but he could stand, and he kind of portrayed that to the public, that he was strong, right, because the country was in perilous times and he needed to show strength. And often, he would have somebody prop him up or he would lean on, on a podium or something. And during these different functions, state dinners and, and uh, diplomatic, uh, things that he had to attend, he would stand and, and greet the people as they would come in. And he got tired of these receiving lines because it seemed to him that nobody cared what he had to say. They were all too busy thinking what they were going to say to the president, right? So one day he got so tired of it, he says, these people don't care what I have to say. He says, in fact, he leaned to one of his advisors there, he says, watch this. And as the people were coming through line, he, uh, he would shake their hand and he said, I murdered my grandmother this morning. And some of them, completely missing that, said, oh, bless you, keep up the good work, Mr. <laughs> President, and shaking his hand. Others would say, thank you for what you've just done. <laughs> and so nobody listened. Well, that went down the line, the same story. Nobody was listening until he got to a foreign diplomat, diplomat that was in line, and he didn't speak English too well, and uh, he was listening very closely, trying to, to discern English, and when the president said, I murdered my grandmother this morning, he said, well, Mr. President, and he kind of hesitated, kind of awkwardly, not knowing what to say, he said, I'm sure she had it coming to her. <laughs> <laughs> so, I thought about this. I think God is crying out to us. He, why don't you listen to me? Why don't, I have so much to say to you, so much love to give you. Why don't you listen? And all we can say or think of is what we have um, on our hearts and we don't listen to him. So I want to close with a object lesson today. So I need a volunteer for this. and I'm going to get set up here. Maybe a young person. Is there a brave young person that either came up earlier that was brave or somebody else? Come on up. Don't be shy. I'm seeing some pointers back in the back. Come on. Yeah, come on up here. I thank you for being brave today. All right. You would have came up not even knowing what you're getting into. But I have something for you. Stand there by the chair. And I have... And I just lost part of it. There we go. Okay. I have a block of wood here, right? You can hold that for a second. And what are these? Nails. Whoops. Yeah, nails. I've got, I've got a little one here. And I've got a little bit bigger one. And I've got this one. Is that the biggest one you've ever seen? That's about the biggest I've ever seen, too. My dad called these bridge spikes. I guess they put bridges together with those. So you can put that wood down here. And I want you to put that nail in the wood. Let's start with the little one. It's probably easier, wouldn't you think? Can you put that nail in the wood? Oh, he's choosing a knot hole. That's smart. All right. Well, this, that's kind of hard. Why don't we get you some help that will do that? What do you say to that? You want some help to put that nail in? Oh, you got the point in? I want you to put it at least halfway in. Can you do that? That's just a little nail. Maybe you can probably put it in halfway, right? Can you put it in any more than that? That's going to hurt your finger, huh? Would you like some help getting that nail in? All right. He says sure. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to offer you some things here. I've got some tools. Now, when I was a young man, I liked to play some tools here with tools. My dad had lots of tools that I got to play with. I have uh I have some things that might help you put those in there. Let's start with this one. What is this? 
Screwdriver. Okay, that's one option. What is this one? A toothbrush. All right, well, okay, that's another option. I have here, okay, what are these? Scissors. Yeah, well, you can choose those if you want. And I have this. That's a hammer. This is a hammer. And this is a hammer. Right? All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see which one, which one are you going to choose to put that little bitty nail in with? You look it over, take your time. Oh, he's going with the hammer. All right. Would you like me to hold it? I'm going to be brave now, too. All right. Try it out. Okay, it started. See if you can put that in at least halfway. Yep, it's going. It's going a little harder, maybe. Does that seem helpful? Is that better than your thumb? It might be bending just a little bit. Sometimes nails get feisty like that. Give it a, give a little harder wax. See if it'll go in more. Yep, it's going in. All right, let's move to the next one. You can put that one down. What do you think might do good for this size nail? Let me hold it up here for, for everyone to see. This one's a little bit bigger. It's, it's more than an inch like this other one was. What do you think? How about this one? Maybe you had your hand on this one. On this one? You think this one would be a good size for that nail? Well, I'll let you try either one you want. Is that, is that putting it in there? Yeah. Let me, let me hold it too. That way you can put your force into it. Give it a good whack. Oh yeah, yep, yep. That's, that seems like the right hammer for the job. All right, so you picked the hammer again. Why didn't you pick the toothbrush? You didn't think it would work? You're right, I don't think it would work either. It, it has these soft bristles on there, not very good for pounding with, and this plastic handle that's kind of flexy, and that nail is metal. It's, it's pretty stiff, huh? I think it'd rebel against that, uh, that toothbrush. Let's, let's try this big guy. You like that one? You don't think the hammer for the big nail? What do you think? You could, well, you, how about you try your, your choice there? Let me hold. Give it a good whack. Don't miss. I'm trusting you. Oh, I think you're getting somewhere. It's a little wobbly still, but I can see the hole starting. Oh, that one didn't quite get there either. Give it a good whack. All right, all right, I, I see where you're going. I'm gonna try the big one, what do you think? All right, I'm gonna, be I'm gonna put it down on the ground. <laughs> do you wanna hold it for me? <laughs> oh, brave, brave. All right, let's give it a whack. All right, I'm gonna hold it too. Whoa, that made a good sound. Did you feel it move? Is the hole bigger? Let's pull it out and see. I made a bigger hole, didn't it? All right. All right, it sounds like we need a little bit firmer uh, platform to pound on, so I'm gonna leave it, <laughs> leave it like that. But it's in there pretty good. I think this is the right one for the job. All right, thank you. You can go back and sit down. So this, this object lesson, where am I going with this? Sometimes it takes the right tool for the job. You know, when Ezekiel was called of God, to be a prophet for the Lord. The Lord, uh, well, the, the Lord was in his holy temple, and, it, and uh, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And when the angel said this, the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. This is just an angel. This isn't the words of the Lord. And so 
Um, Isaiah said, when he heard that, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to him, and he had a live coal in his hand, and he took it to Isaiah's lips and touched his mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, your sin is purged. And I heard, then Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? So here we have an example of when we meet the Lord and when we hear his voice, he often says, Whom shall I send? And that's the parable that we have here. Let's say this wood represents a neighbor, maybe a coworker that you, that you work with, maybe a family member who has never uh, come to believe in God. And sometimes, um, let me take that back. Let's say the wood is the gospel and the nail represents the person that has never come to believe. Somebody that you have contact with, that you have a little bit of rapport with, a little bit of a re relationship. Somebody that God has put in your sphere of influence. And God says, I want you to take that nail, that person who doesn't believe, and I want you to put them safely in my hand, this wood, the gospel message, right? Give them that, that chance to accept him. And God, when he's looking around, for the right person for that job to take that unbeliever and put them into his hand in the gospel message, he's looking around for the right tool, right? So would a toothbrush work for this nail? No. Would this hammer? It's a good looking hammer. Would it work for this nail, this big one? Probably not very well. So it takes the right instrument for the job, right, for this big nail. But somebody who's more delicate like this little one, this little one here that's easily bent and crumpled and ruined, that takes a delicate touch, doesn't it? A gentle touch, a little, little bit of persuasion. So God looks around and he chooses the right person for the task. And when he speaks to us, he gives us instruction on how to do just that. I know each one of us has a neighbor who has yet to hear the truth, maybe a family member, maybe somebody we work with, maybe somebody we just met, but God has just brought them into your life so that they will have a chance to hear about him. And so God has chosen you, and he will speak to you when and how to introduce him to that person. So you can be, maybe you're the big hammer, maybe you're the little one, maybe the job requires the toothbrush to polish a little bit, right, to be soft. Maybe it's not the hammer that's needed, maybe it's softer than that. But God has chosen you for a specific person. Uh, I think back to my childhood, God brought, gave me the parents I needed, and they lived by example, right? Sometimes we think sharing Jesus with somebody is hard and complicated and that we have to know all the theological answers. That's really not how Jesus lived. He lived walking, sharing his uh, um, example, living by example with people, um, being honest and pure and true. And people start to ask questions just like they did of Jesus. They asked him so many questions about life. The disciples taught, asked him to teach them how to pray. And uh, how, they had so many questions, and Jesus patiently answered each one. So you have that person, but you don't have to rely on yourself. God gives you instruction on how to do just that. As my parents led by example and led me to Christ, maybe your parents did the same thing. Maybe you are fulfilling that role in the lives of your children. Maybe your neighbor whom you don't even know yet, is crying out to hear the gospel message. And God wants you to stop talking a little bit long, just a little bit, long enough where he can say, I have a world out there that's dying, and I want you to go and live by example and reach out and share love with that person I've called for you to witness to. 
So, as we close, let's sing a closing song together. It's not one that we have in our hymnal. It may be familiar to some of you. It's called, Here I Am, Lord. Here I Am, Lord. And it's a call to listen to God, to listen for his voice, whether it may be audible or still and small, like the Holy Spirit teaching us all things, bringing to our remembrance the words of the Lord, or um, whatever it may be, God will choose you and share with you just the message that you need in your own life, like we read about with the lilies and the birds, um, but also in that other person life, person's life that he's called you to share with them. So let's sing together, Here I Am, Lord. This song, the, uh, it's a pretty song. And the verses are the words of the Lord looking for his people, recognizing his people and their pain and sin. The chorus is your response. So let's sing this song together. I've never heard the piano parts.
Dear Heavenly Father, in Jeremiah chapter 29, you said that if we will seek you, that we will find you when we search for you with all our hearts. And so, Lord, it's really convicting to us not to just blabber all our wants and desires to you without taking the time to seek you with our hearts and to pause and to listen to what you have to say through your holy word, the scriptures, and through your Holy Spirit whispering in our ear, Lord. You want to give us direction and guidance for our lives and, and tell us how much you love us and show us um, many things that we have not yet understood, but your spirit is longing to tell us. And Lord, you told the disciples long ago that you had many more things to tell them, but they were not ready to handle it. They were not ready to receive it, but that you would send the Comforter and to teach them all things that you, that you wanted to tell them, but yet they, they weren't ready for. So, Lord, we ask for the Spirit to whisper in our hearts, to teach us those things that you would have us to know. And, Lord, I have a feeling that when, when we pause to listen to you, you're going to tell us about somebody else who needs to know about your love. And Lord, give us the courage to just live by example, sharing the gospel by the way that we live. And as people ask questions why we are so different, let us tell them that it's because our Lord Jesus Christ saved us out of a deep love for us, and that has made all the difference. Lord, I think of the children's story about Lucky, and we can identify with that mangy dog that's in such a bad way, but yet we see that our master loves us enough to come and sacrifice himself that we would be saved. Amen. And so, Lord, let us carry that throughout this coming week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.